Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C. And today we're going to be doing something new for the first time. We're going to do a major exam. What I'm going to do is show you an actual exam that I gave to my classes. So you can practice doing a huge exam and it's going to cover the introductory chapter, the chemistry chapter, all the cell theory, and all the tissues we've just covered. So this is a big one. So let's jump in and get busy. Question one. Anatomy is the study of blank of the body, while physiology is the study of its blank. So anatomy is structure and physiology is function. Now, of course, there are other things you could put in these blanks, but I'm trying to limit this to what we discussed in our lectures in the past. Blank is the study of tissues, that would be histology. And blank is the study of cells, that would be cytology. Through bonding, atoms combine with each other to form molecules. A group of cells with similar shape, function, working all together is called a tissue. The blank system, asking for one of the 11 body systems, forms the external body covering. That would be the integument system. Remember, skin is not a system. Integument would be the system. The blank system allows us to move objects in the environment as well as to move our own bodies. So that's the muscle or muscular system. Organs of the blank system secrete chemicals called hormones that should be a giveaway immediately you're talking the endocrine system the blank system transports nutrients oxygen carbon dioxide electrolyte wastes throughout the body in the blood that would be the cv system or the cardiovascular system blank refers to the entire set of chemical reactions which occur within an organism metabolism To maintain homeostasis, a blank must monitor the internal or external environment to detect changes. That would be a receptor, the first part of the homeostatic control mechanism. Blank refers to chemical reactions which break apart complex molecules and release energy. So anytime you're breaking, you're talking about catabolism, right? Catabolism or catabolic reactions. Three minimal parts of a system which maintains homeostasis are the receptor, the integrator, also known as the control center, and the effector. The mouth is blank to the chin, usually a directional term. Okay, so think about it. The mouth is above the chin. So you could say the mouth is superior to the chin. The eyes are blank to the bridge of the nose, okay? The bridge of the nose is right in the middle of the body. The eyes are not in the middle. They're further away from the middle. So you would say the eyes are lateral to the bridge of the nose. If you flipped, you would say the bridge of the nose is medial to the eyes. The pinky fingers, okay, this one's tricky because you have to stand in anatomical position, right? You can switch your hand around, but there's a rule to it. You have to stand with your palms forward, which means your thumbs should be pointing out away from the body. So in this question, the pinky fingers are medial to the thumbs, and the thumbs would be lateral. The brain is blank to the skull. Well, this one's a little strange because the skull kind of encompasses the brain. So you would say the brain is underneath the skull, but it's not really underneath. Uh, it's below it, like as a layer. So the term here is the brain is deep to the skull. Cervical. Now you could cheat and say cervical refers to the cervix, but that's 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 kind of a circular answer. Cervical refers to a neck of something, a neck. Axillary, not auxiliary. Axillary refers to the armpits. 
Blank refers to the anterior elbow. The anterior elbow is called the antecubital area. Cephalic, cephalic, refers to the head of something. Cep, ceph, or cephalic, the head of something. Blank refers to the shoulder blade. Okay, the blade specifically, not the part that juts out to the side, so that would be the scapula. So the term would be scapular. Would be a perfect answer for that one. Otic, or not optic. It's not a. Uh, it's not a typo here. Otic refers to the ear. Blank refers to the back of the knee. All right, the front of the knee is patellar. The back of the knee is popliteal or popliteal. The blank plane separates superior and inferior. So that's top from bottom. And if you separate top from bottom, it's the saw the lady in half trick. So you could call that a horizontal plane or a transverse plane. The blank plane separates left lateral and right lateral portions of an object at the midline. So you're talking about cutting left from right. Anytime you cut left from right, regardless if it's on the midline or whatever, would be sagittal. So you could say if it is cutting it directly at the midline that it is mid-sagittal plane if you wanted to get super specific there. The lungs are found in the blank cavity. Now, you could choose a bunch of different things here, but it says use the most specific cavity that is appropriate. And in this case, it makes it easier for me to answer that, and that would be plural, the plural cavity. The pericardial cavity is located within the blank cavity. Again, use the most specific cavity that is appropriate. For this one, again, you could say it's in the ventral cavity, but we need to get more specific, and we'll say it's in the thoracic cavity. So are the lungs, remember. The lungs are in the thoracic cavity also, but most more specifically, they're in plural. So pericardial cavity is within the thoracic cavity. The brain is found within the blank cavity. Again, use the most specific cavity. You could say it's in the dorsal cavity, you'd be right, but it's not as specific as saying it's in the cranial cavity, cranial. The blank separates the abdominal pelvic cavity from the thoracic cavity. Well, that's the uh, muscular rainbow, the sheet of muscle called the diaphragm. Organs in the ventral body cavity are surrounded by double-layered membranes called serosae. The layer closest to the organ is the blank, and the layer which lines the body wall is called the parietal serosa. Okay, so the blank must be the thing that's not the parietal serosa, which would be the visceral, the visceral serosa. So the blank should be the visceral serosa. These two layers, the parietal and the visceral serosa, are separated by serous fluid because there's not a specific organ given. We just say organ. So here would be just plain old serous fluid. Not serious, but serous. Atoms are composed of subatomic particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. And any order is fine. It's just got to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yeah, you could get Fancy if you wanted to do some more physics, but I'm talking about what we covered in our lectures. The nucleus of an atom consists of approximately, but not always, an equal number of blank and blank. So this question is really saying, what do we find in a nucleus? And the answer are protons and neutrons. And they are approximately equal number, but not always. Okay, electrons have a weight of approximately how many AMU? Well, zero. That's what we do when we do the math. You could get picky and one two thousandth and something. That's okay. We'll just go zero. While protons and neutrons both weigh one AMU. What is an atomic weight of an atom that has five protons and six neutrons? Okay, well, if you want atomic weight, that's exactly what you need to do is weigh the protons and neutrons because that's what's found in the nucleus. So simply 5 plus 6 would be 11. That's the atomic weight of something with 5p and 6n. What is the atomic number 
of an atom with 75 protons and 76 neutrons. And if you think, let me get my calculator out, you've already missed the question. Remember, atomic number is literally defined as the number of protons. So if you're given the number of protons, 75, then that's your answer, 75. You do not add this to it or you'd get the atomic weight. A little tricky. Four most abundant elements in the human body or any other organism for that matter are blank, 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 blank. Four. I'm looking for four things. What is it? It's chon, right? C-H-O-N. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. When many atoms are held together by chemical bonds, the resulting structure is called a molecule. That's just a fancy way of asking that same question I asked already. A molecule is many atoms held together by bonds. Except for the electron energy shell closest to the nucleus, which is full with only blank. How many does it take to fill that first shell to, right? The octet rule tells us this. Other larger shells may have, octet rule says eight electrons in their shell. This is referred to as the octet rule. So it kind of gave that away in a strange order. The first blank would be two. The second blank will be eight. And then the third blank would be octet. Blank bonds form. We have three choices formed by the transfer or transfer of electrons. Okay. If you do a transfer, that's an ionic bond. While blank are formed when electrons are shared. Well, that's a covalent bond. Biological catalysts are called enzymes, and they are primarily made of protein. Organic compounds all, every stinking one of them, contain blank and blank. Well, organic carb compounds are called hydrocarbons, so they contain hydrogen and carbon H and C. Products of ionization are often called, now you could cheat here and say ions, and you wouldn't be cheating because you'd be correct, but I bet that if I had my key in front of me, the answer on it would be electrolytes because of that second part says where they carry an electric current. So you could put ions there and probably get away with it, but electrolytes would be a better answer. The pH scale goes from what to what? Well, the lowest is zero and the highest is 14 from zero to 14. Seven is in the middle. The four major classes of organic molecules, and I've got four blanks, they're protein, it didn't matter the order here, proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. Proteins, carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. Organic molecules are formed in blank reactions. Well, let's, okay, in which water molecules are removed from the, okay, that tells me everything. Water removed is dehydration. So the, I, I bet the best answer would be dehydration synthesis. So organic molecules are formed in dehydration synthesis reactions in which water is removed. Organic carbohydrates are always made of and only three things. And it's a specific ratio of these things. If you want to get fancy, it's C, H, and O, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. A blank is formed by replacing one fatty acid in a triglyceride. Okay, picture triglyceride with its glycerol head and the three tails coming out. If I replace one of those tails with a phosphorus group, it's no longer a triglyceride. It is now a phospholipid. Phospholipid. Proteins are made of blank amino acids joined together in a chain, held together by blank bonds, peptide. So amino acids here, peptide here. Sucrose is a disaccharide. It's made of blank and blank, which means the two monosaccharides which it's created from, and linked together with what type of bond? So the two things that sucrose is always made of is glucose and fructose. Now the, the third blank you could put covalent, and you would be correct, but a more technical answer would be a glycosidic bond. Blank, blank. 
are a type of organic molecule made of nucleotide monomers. A lot of giveaways there. It's a nucleic acid. Nucleic acid. The nucleotides, in turn, are made of three components. Aha, so what builds up a nucleotide? A phosphate group, a pentose sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose, and some sort of base containing nitrogen. Okay, so nucleic acid here, and then some sort of pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base, in any order down there. The blank structure of a protein, and there's only four, refers to the linking of two separate globular protein molecules. Okay, a globular protein molecule is a third order of structure, tertiary. So if you take two of them that are separately formed and glue them together to form a single unit, this is the fourth level of protein folding or the quaternary structure. Quaternary. What is meant by the term hexose? I named two examples that we learned about. And there are many, by the way, but hexose is a six carbon monosaccharide. A monosaccharide, a sugar unit with six carbons. Name two examples. We talked about glucose and fructose and galactose, although there are many others if you'd like to look them up. The primary molecule used by the cell to supply energy when needed. They might think carb immediately, but no. I'm talking about ATP, and it says it after the comma, which is simply a specialized nucleotide. Perfect. The energy in this fuel molecule will be specifically stored in its bonds, right? In those high energy phosphate bonds. So ATP in this blank and bonds in this blank, specifically phosphate bonds or high energy bonds. The blank structure, again, looking for one of the four folding structures of protein refers to the folding and usually leads to the formation of beta pleated sheets and alpha helices. Well, when you get these pleated sheets or the curly cues, we're looking at the secondary structure, the second order folding of a protein. So secondary goes in the blank. When a protein unfolds, its function is lost. This unraveling process is called denaturing. Denaturing. If a word ends in ace, it probably refers to an enzyme. An enzyme, probably. If it ends in os, it probably refers to a sugar. Probably. Not always. Ace, enzyme, os, sugar. The five common nitrogenous bases in nucleic acid, you're thinking, wait a minute, there's only four, G-A-T-C, don't forget about U, right? That's found in RNA. So the letters would be G, A, T, C, and U in any order. But if I asked you to spell them out, guanine, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. In DNA, G and C nucleotides, remember they bond together, A with T and G with C, are held together with how many bonds? Well, they're held together with three and the bond type is that dashed line called hydrogen bonding, so H bonds. Name the pentose, the pentose sugar, right? Five carbon monosaccharide found in the backbones of RNA. Well, the R tells you the answer in RNA, ribose. Okay, let's do a little bit uh, more difficult one. Let's scroll up a bit more here. All right, considering the atomic model below, right here where I'm moving my cursor, what can you tell about aluminum? And there's a bunch of questions here about it. I won't be able to write on this, but let's go through it. I've given you even more hints here. If you don't want to count all the dots and the molecule down there, you could to confirm that I'm not an idiot, but what are those dots? We'll start there. Those darts are the electrons, right? In the shells. So 13E you can assume, in my class always, there's an equal number of P's because this is not an ion, it's, it's, it's an atom. And then 13 neutrons is an assumption. We cannot see that and we cannot discern that by looking, so I'm giving you that information, telling you that's true. So 13P, 13N, 13E would be given. The picture would be given. And let's hit the, the questions. Now, number of protons, well, right up here it says 13. Even though I can't see them in the nucleus here, 
I know there's 13. Number of neutrons, 13. Number of electrons, 13. Atomic number. Remember, atomic number is defined as the number of protons, so it should be the same as this answer, which was 13. It's our lucky number 13 today, huh? Atomic weight. Again, if you want to know the weight, you weigh the nucleus. What's in the nucleus? The protons and the neutrons. So 13 plus 13, 26. Atomic weight, 26. Number of energy shells. Okay, well, that's these big rings that come out from the nucleus. So there's one, two, three energy shells. Three. Number of valence shells. Well, this is, there can only be one, right? The valence shell is the outermost shell. And the answer is always one. There can only be one valence shell, so one. Number of valence electrons. That is how many electrons are in that valence shell. Well, there's one here. Roll over, there's two. And roll over, here's three. So three valence electrons. Is this atom stable or is it reactive? Well, it's reactive. Why? Because it's got an unfilled valence. It doesn't have eight in its valence. So it's reactive and wants to try to achieve stability or fullness. Is it electropositive or electronegative? Well, if it has fewer than four Remember, that's the rule we learned. If it has fewer than four valence electrons, and if you go back here, we learned, we just determined there was three valence electrons, one, two, three, then we would be electropositive because we have fewer than four. And for that reason, I would be likely to lose electrons to achieve stability. I could gain five and get stable, but it would be easier to lose three. So lose. All right, so to recap, 13 protons, 13 neutrons, 13 electrons, 13 is the atomic number, 26 is the weight, 3 shells, 1 valence shell, 3 electrons in the valence shell, reactive, electropositive, likely to lose. Great. Okay, I show a molecule here. Refer to the figure above and tell me what type of fatty acid is shown. Hmm. You don't have to name it specifically, but I see this double bond and this double bond, which means it's not maximally saturated with hydrogen. We're missing one here. We're missing one here. So two, actually. So I got some kinks in the tails. They would tell me I am an unsaturated fatty acid. That's the answer I'd be looking for. At room temperature, you would expect it to be more liquid than solid, right? Any kink you put in the tail makes it the molecule more floppy and more floppy, so the more liquid it would get. Okay, now it looks like we've moved into some cell biology. The part of a human cell that stores and protects the genetic information known as DNA is the nucleus. Nucleus would go here. Two major components of a cell membrane are phospholipids, number one, and protein, number two. I guess you could put them in any order here because it doesn't say their significance, but phospholipids are the most, and then proteins are number two. When a molecule moves from an area of high concentration to low, so we're going high to low, regardless of how it got there, means it doesn't matter how it got there, whether it's through a pump or through anything, it didn't have help, we don't know, it doesn't care. If we go from high to low, we are called passive passive transport. That is the best answer that would fit in that blank. If a molecule can only pass with the assistance of a membrane protein. Okay, well, there's, there's a passive mechanism that does that and an active mechanism that uses membrane proteins. So we got to go further. And the direction of its travel is down the gradient. Again, high to low. So if we're going high to low, that's a passive mechanism. It even gives you a hint here because the word diffusion is there. And we're using a membrane protein to assist us. So this is facilitated diffusion. Facilitated is what would go in the blank. When water moves through a membrane from an area where there is more water to where there's an area of less water. Another way to say that is an area where there is fewer particles to an area where there are more particles. And another thing is, whenever you see movement of water, the answer is always osmosis. Just go straight there, and that's correct again. 
If water is moving across a membrane, it's called osmosis. When a cell is surrounded by a solution of lower, lower particle concentration, that means the high particle concentration is in the cell, which means it would tend to suck in water. The solution is said to be hypotonic, has fewer particles, right? It says right here, lower particles in the solution. For the solution is hypotonic, and the net movement of water would be into the cell where it is hypertonic, and water would follow those particles into the cell. When ATP energy is being used to move a solute through a protein pump from low to high, okay, if we're going low to high, we're talking active, and the membrane transport process is just called active transport. You could call it true active, but that's what we're doing. We're just going from low to high using a protein pump with ATP is the key here. The innermost membrane of the mitochondria is all folded, forming wrinkles or crests called cristae, where cellular respiration occurs. Not the best question, but the wrinkled folding inner membrane is cristae. 100%. Blank. Are organelles largely made of RNA whose function is to synthesize proteins from amino acids? We know the guys that make proteins are called ribosomes, and that must be the answer, and it is ribosomes. The function of blank varies greatly from cell type to cell type, but usually includes lipid metabolism, such as steroid synthesis or whatever the heck it wants to put there. The point is lipid synthesis, and that would be the smooth ER, smooth or SER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Proteins leaving through, or leaving the, sorry, leaving the rough ER, the RER, are transported to the blank for modification and secretion. That would be the Golgi body. The Golgi receives packages from the ER, modifies, repackages, and secretes, delivers. The organelle within the cell whose main functions are digestion, autolysis, and enzymatic hydrolysis of debris and bacteria. That's a fancy way of talking about janitors, right, that are cleaning up crud in the cell. And the janitors of the cell are the lysosomes, lysosomes. Short cellular projections used to move fluid or particles, you could argue, across the surface are called cilia, cilia. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is distinguished by the presence of the rough ER. I remember it's got bumps all over it. We said it's studded or peppered with ribosomes again. Just asked about ribosomes. There's a repeat. Same answer though. Ribosomes. Ribosomal RNA is produced in the, you could say nucleus, but you got to get more specific and say nucleolus. That's the best, most specific answer. Ribosomal RNA is made in the nucleolus. Briefly distinguish between chromatin and chromosomes. And it's a four-pointer. It would be a short answer. I would want, you know, a couple of sentences explaining why we have these two forms of DNA, noting which proteins assist the transformation. Okay, we would say something like chromatin is an uncondensed, spaghettified form of DNA. It's opened, it's usable, it's readable. Chromosomes, however, are a closed-up, highly condensed form of DNA. It's the same DNA, but it's all packaged up. And the proteins which assist this transformation are called histones. Another way you could say this is the usable form, chromatin, and this is the movable form, chromosomes. Something like that is what I would be looking for. Cell cycle can be divided into two major phases, blank, which is the biggest part, and mitosis. And the biggest part is a big I for interphase. Cells that have permanently stopped dividing enter a phase of the cell cycle, which you could argue is not a phase, known as G0, right? G0, gap zero. Interphase can be divided into three subphases, blank, R slash S, and blank. So R slash S is replication of the DNA or synthesis of DNA. In front of it is a growth, 
and behind it is a growth or what we call gap one and gap two and that's why it goes there g1 and g2 mitosis consists of four phases in order they are pro blank blank and telo so remember it's pmat was the trick here pmat so m and a are the ones we're missing m is for meta phase and a is for anaphase so prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase okay in blank phase of mitosis it's asking you to pick one of those four sister chromatids are ripped apart mercilessly well that gives you the answer they're ripped apart ana for apart anaphase during which phase individual chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell again middle is meta so metaphase in blank phase a new a new envelope forms so that must be at the very very end if a new envelope is forming because we know it disappears at the beginning of mitosis so the very end phase is telophase even late telophase if you wanted to get fancy in blank phase chromatin condenses to its chromosomal state so that is when we're going from a movable no a usable form to a movable form it's condensing up and that's going to happen very early in the process so it's going to happen first that would be the pro phase in which chromatin condenses to chromosome the final act of cell division in which the cell finally splits that's redundant isn't it into two daughter cells is called cytokinesis lots of people miss this one cytokinesis is the final act where we split the four major tissue types are epithelial something something and nervous well one of them's muscle and one of them's connective that's how we study them was epithelial connective muscle and nervous what occurs during SRR phase of interphase just went over this but replication of DNA or synthesis of DNA DNA is doubled and there's many ways to say that connective tissue is characterized are we in the tissue section already connective tissue is characterized by the presence of its blank a sticky substance in the spaces between the cells and fibers okay that's either the matrix or the ground substance All right, epithelial tissues whose cells are arranged into a single layer of cells, single, meaning simple, right? Simple is the word, whereas multilayered cells are classified as stratified. So simple is one layer, stratified is multilayered. Blank cells are squashed, shaped like thin ovals, and largely serve as protection as their function. So squashed, remember, reminds us of squamous, or as some people pronounce it, squamous, but that's squamous. That is what goes in the blank there. Blank is a tissue which is easily stretched and found only in parts of the urinary system. Well, that should be a hint. The only one we talked about that's only found in the urinary system was transitional epithelium. Let's make sure. It consists of several layers, yep. Yeah in which cells are usually dome-shaped, yep, if the tissue is not compressed. So, yeah, transitional epithelium is the answer there. Transitional epithelium. Blank is a rope-like, extremely strong, fibrous protein, which gives connective tissue its great tensile strength. Okay, all of that describes collagen. Collagen fibers. Collagen. Blank means containing no blood vessels characteristic of epithelial tissue that would be a vascular no vessels a vascular a vascular blank are long branching collagenous fibers found in lymphatic tissue well long branching branching is the key here branching collagen is called reticular and that is often found in lymphatic tissue reticular tissue or reticular fibers would be the perfect answer there Blank is a specific type of tissue which consists of single layer, that would be simple, of boxy cells, that would be cuboid or cuboidal, 
with large spherical nuclei, which the creator absorb. The point is right here, simple cuboidal, simple cuboidal. You could even say simple cuboidal epithelium if you wanted to get really specific. Blank glands are ductless. That is, their products are released directly into the blood. It would go here, so that's endocrine. Endocrine glands are ductless. They dump their product straight into the blood. Blank are fibrous proteins in connective tissue that, when stretched, snap back to their original length. This sounds like an elastic waistband, so that's your answer. Elastic fibers. Or elastins, you could put. Most glands are multicellular. In fact, the only unicellular gland that we ever discussed are the goblet cells. Goblet cells, that's it. The active matrix-making cells in cartilage are called, this can be tricky, but cartilage root is chondro. And if we're making cartilage, that's a blast. So chondroblast would fit there. Chondroblast. And similarly here, the major matrix breaking cell. A breaker is a clast. So if you're breaking bone now, that'd be an osteoclast. That's why I would go here, osteoclast. A specific connective tissue called blank contains many big round cells whose nuclei have been pushed aside by the large volume of lipids that's stored in the cell. That sounds like adipose tissue. Fat tissue, right? Adipose, adipose. Thin and sticky epithelial membranes, which line body cavities that are open to the outside world, are called mucous membranes, mucous membranes. I don't really care how you would spell it, even though there's two different ways, mucus is the answer. Striations, stripes, right? Ribs are characteristic of blank muscle cells and blank muscle cells. So we know there's three types of muscle cells. Two of them have striations. That would be skeletal and cardiac. Skeletal and cardiac would go in the blanks. Two distinguishable features of cardiac tissue are branches called blank and communicative structures called blank that lie between two cells. So the branches are called bifurcations and the structures that help communicate are called intercalated discs. What type of tissue makes up the skeleton of the embryo? Hyaline cartilage. All right, if I showed this on a test, I would have it labeled and say, you know, name or match up the parts. So let's just try to label some things. Uh, this thing here would be a and a protein that spans the membrane. I would call that an integral protein. One like this, that's not quite going all the way through, kind of sticks out on the periphery. I would call that a peripheral protein. Here are these little balls with the tails. Those are phospholipids. And the ball, the head, is what we would call that, the polar head. And then the, the, the feet sticking out here, the nonpolar tails. You can see here cholesterol associating with the fatty tails of the phospholipids. You can see some glycoproteins here. You can see a glycolipid here. And that's about what I see when I see that picture. There's not much else I can show on that one, but it's a pretty good shot of a cell membrane. Okay, so if you had a system, an osmotic system, where you had a cell that has 6.3% salts, and I would highly recommend drawing this out if you ever have a question like this on a test. We did it as buckets of water, right? So you have a cell that's 6.3 salt, and you drop it into a beaker of water, a solution, with 6.6 .6 salt. So the first thing before you even look at anything else is where are there more particles, in the cell or in the solution? Well, they're in the solution. So that's the hypertonic area. The cell is the hypotonic area. So let's look. Which area, the solution or cell, has a higher concentration of particles? Well, the solution does. It tells us that very clearly. So the solution does. What tonic word describes the cell? 
Well, if the solution has the particles, it's hypertonic. Therefore, the cell is hypotonic. And in this system, which way will the water go? It will go to the hypertonic area, which is a solution. And the cell should shrink. Water should leave the cell. Okay, we're going to get some pictures here of histology and some questions below each one. Let's give it a shot. Okay, there's that threadbare blanket or threadbare coat that's been torn and we can see the fibers. So I think I know what this one is. Let's see. Name the specific tissue type. Well, that's areolar tissue or very loose connective tissue. Name the major type of tissue. Well, that's a, a type of connective tissue. Then name the long black threads like you see here. My cursor moving over all over it. Really, you see a bunch of these. Those are elastic fibers. So areolar, connective, and elastic. All right, this is, well, what do you see? I see wavy bacon. That's my trick that we used in class. I see these long collagenous waves. So give a location. This would be found in, say, tendons or ligaments. Name the specific type. This is not called wavy bacon, but regular and dense, right? Dense, regular connective tissue. Dense, regular connective tissue. And the function is to withstand pull or has great tensile strength. There are many ways to say it, specifically in one direction. All right, what do you see here? I got cherry blossoms immediately when I see this one. So name the major type. Major type is connective. It's just a type of connective tissue. What's the specific type? Cherry blossoms tells me reticular tissue. Give a location where you find reticular tissue in lymphatic structures like lymph nodes or the spleen. All right, I see a lot of little wiggly worms. And that's our hint, wiggle worms. This is elastic tissue. But we're not asked that. We're asked where the location is. And this is a wall of a giant artery, probably the walls of a large artery. And name the major class. Major class is connective tissue. So it didn't even ask us specifically that this was elastic tissue. But location, walls of large arteries, what you're seeing here. Name the major class, connective. Specific class is elastic tissue. Okay, well, there's our octopus party, right? A bunch of octopuses swimming around together with these little pieces of food that's been sprinkled in. So it's classic nervous tissue right there. Name the specific type, nervous. It's the only type that we learned. Name the function uh, to transmit electrical impulses, also known as action potentials. Okay, looks a bit messy. Something should be jumping out at you, though, are these dark bands that are almost the color of my cursor here, moving from band to band to band to band. It's a giveaway. We're looking at heart tissue here, right? Anytime we see these dark bands. So what's the specific type is cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle. And the dark bands that I indicated are called intercalated discs. And their function is to communicate with their neighboring cell. Okay, I see some dome-shaped cells. I see the scream face. I see binucleate cells at the top. This is classic transitional epithelium. So let's see what we are asked about it. Name the specific type, transitional epithelium. Give a location, the urinary system. I see a train wreck of nuclei. I see cilia. I see a big open space. So I'm looking at specifically here, ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar epithelium. That's fun to write, but that would be required all that. Ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar epithelium. Name the function. Here is secretion, although you could put absorption and you'd be right also. All right. What do I see here? Eyes in the jungle with some cracked 
matrix. So this is elastic cartilage. Let's look. Name the major class is just connective tissue. Name the specific type, elastic cartilage. Not elastic tissue, but elastic cartilage. Where would I find elastic cartilage? Well, this has been asked already, the pinna of the ear or the epiglottis. All right, I see tree rings. I know I'm looking at bone tissue or osseous tissue. Name the major class, though, is not bone. The major class is connective tissue. Specifically, it's bone or osseous, but major class is connective tissue. Name the location, the skeleton, bones. Okay, what do we got here? The pipes stacked on top of one another, the ribbed pipes. So we, when we see the stack of pipes, we go to skeletal muscle first thing. So name the specific type, skeletal muscle. Elongated, striated, multinucleate cells stacked on top of each other. Name the function, move the skeleton, or sometimes muscles, skin, and the face. That's it. That's a big one. Uh, how'd you do? How many questions were there? A bazillion, right? I don't know the total number. But that's a great test of your knowledge so far. And from here, we'll move on to new oceans to sail through. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.